So next, um, I have the pleasure of introducing Shelda Shaw. I met her uh, several years ago. We actually tried to recruit her to the University of Washington when I was there. Uh, good thing that we didn't do that because uh, she might be upset that I left. But um, she actually has written one of the most uh, amazing papers and highly cited papers on cost effectiveness of uh, gastric cancer screening. And so I think it's just, it, it, this is timely. It's an important discussion. Uh, and she has some great data for us. Uh, she is currently an assistant professor at Vanderbilt. Uh, doing some great things uh, in cost-effectiveness studies. So with that, uh, I'd like to introduce Shelda Shah. Welcome. Um, so good. I wanted to thank the uh, organizers of um, this summit. Really exciting and a great initiative. Um, and I'm excited to um, for the invitation to speak on the cost-effectiveness of gastric cancer screening in the United States. So I have no disclosures. And you'll probably see this slide several times um, throughout this, this conference, but it's really a critical slide and an important one. Um, gastric cancer remains the third leading cause of cancer mortality and the fifth most common cancer worldwide. Um, there's marked global um, and ethnic uh, variation throughout. And Southeast Asia, as we've seen, accounts for the majority, the vast majority of these cases, um, followed by Central America, Latin America, and Eastern Europe. But even though there's marked global variation, there's also within country variation. And so the United States, even though um, it is considered a low incidence country with gastric cancer ranking as the 15th most common, um, you can see that it accounts for over 27,000 new cases each year, and which is about 10,000 more um, than esophageal cancer, which is a cancer, as we've heard, is screened for um, for a select population. And so gastric cancer we don't screen for, and that's really reflected in the dismal um, survival, five-year survival of 31.5%. But when we look deeper, as we've um, seen just before with a with great talk about the racial and ethnic differences in gastric cancer incidents throughout the United States, that um, we see that it's an uneven distribution. So men uh, more commonly have gastric cancer than women, and then there's, of course, racial and ethnic uh, differences. So you can see black, um, Asians, uh, Hispanics have a much higher incidence compared to non-Hispanic whites. So the most common form of gastric cancer is the intestinal type, um, non-cardia um, adenocarcinoma, which develops as the um, progression from chronic gastritis, chronic gastritis with the most common trigger, H. pylori. And then there's um, both exogenous as well as endogenous factors that contribute to the progression, a stepwise progression from atrophic gastritis to intestinal metaplasia, dysplasia, and a very small percentage to um, actual cancer intestinal type. Um, so it really is the fact that we have these discrete histopathologic stages that can be identified and the slow sojourn time of these, which is really analogous to both esophageal and colorectal cancer as well. And that really does the opportunity for, offer the opportunity for early detection. And so if we take a step back and look to WHO for guidelines on what conditions should be screened for, we do see that gastric cancer actually meets essentially um, the majority of these, if not all of them, which I'll hopefully convince you of. So the condition is important. We do understand the natural course of the condition um, adequately. We've demonstrated that there is a recognizable latent or early symptomatic stage. We would for the most part, agree that endoscopy is a suitable um, examination for the public. We do have accepted treatment for patients with recognized early disease. We do have the facilities for diagnosis and treatment available. And then it really comes down to this last one. The cost of case finding, including the diagnosis and treatment, are economically balanced in relation to possible expenditures on medical care as a whole. And this is the really key one because it comes down to um, non-selected versus selected screening and really optimizing that high-risk population. And so in the United States, um, there are two previous studies um, prior to ours from 2011 and 2016, and I just wanted to point these out. Um, the first one from 2011 uh, was um, performed as a modeling study performed in a general US population aged over 50. Um, age 50 and above, looking at both esophageal as well as gastric cancer screening. And so they had two screening modalities that they looked at, um, a one-time upper endoscopy at the time of colonoscopy um, at age 50 with no subsequent follow-up unless um, a cancer was potentially diagnosed. And then the second st strategy was the same thing, um, but surveillance only if Barrett's was diagnosed. So they actually did include um, gastric preneoplastic lesions in here. <coughs> 
And that second modality was the one that was cost effective based on the, um, a willingness to pay threshold of $100,000, which we'll also discuss. And then the second one um, was not a general population, but was looking specifically at males above the age of 50 and then stratified by their smoking status as current, former, or never. And the modalities that they used here um, were three. So serum pepsinogen with a reflex endoscopy if, um, if that screening test was positive. Endoscopy alone were H. pylori screening starting at the age of 20. Um, so none of these were, were cost effective except for the group of smokers um, and looking at serum pepsinogen as the initial screening test. But I will highlight that serum pepsinogen is not something, it's not a test that's clinically available in the United States, um, hasn't been validated in US populations, and also smoking can affect um, pepsinogen levels. So the key point here, though, is that neither study accounted for the differential risk of gastric, preneoplastic, or neoplastic lesions based on race and ethnicity. So we hypothesize that selected gastric cancer screening among high-risk populations might be a cost-effective intervention in the United States, which is an overall low-incidence country. And that race, ethnicity, and immigrant status are simple ways to identify high-risk populations who might benefit from screening to identify any preneoplasia and then surveillance if that is identified. And this then would be augmented by potential additional factors like family history, smoking, or persistent H. pylori. So to test these hypotheses, we developed a Markov decision model um, in which the base case was a 50-year-old person of, um, of who is non-Hispanic white, non-Hispanic black, Hispanic, or Asian, and um, who was undergoing colonoscopy for colon cancer, average risk colon cancer screening at the age of 50. And so the three modalities, and the rationale here was to really um, minimize costs so that there wouldn't be additional facility or anesthesia um, utilization fees. So the three modalities that um, we selected were endoscopy with biopsies of the antrum and, and body um, with continued surveillance if uh, intestinal metaplasia was diagnosed, um, endoscopy with the same biopsies, um, but every two years, um, irrespective of pathology, so even if it was normal. And this really was based on um, the national guidelines in both Japan and Korea, which we'll be hearing about later, but to also model that. And then the third was a no endoscopic screening strategy, which is the current standard of care in the US. And then based on um, population probabilities for each race and ethnicity, they would enter into the Markov model. Um, and then the individuals could transition between different health states based on assumptions for those probabilities based on their race and ethnicity. So as an example, somebody could um, be diagnosed with H. pylori positive gastritis, um, progressive atrophic gastritis, intestinal metaplasia, dysplasia, and then various stages of, of gastric cancer. And if they were diagnosed in an early stage, then they could um, potentially be eligible for curative resection and then enter into a surveillance program. So every six months annually, and then if they were still um, with no evidence of recurrence, fall back into the intestinal metaplasia um, transition state. And so each of these health states was modeled so that it would last one year. And we simulated a cohort of 10,000 individuals for um, among each race and ethnicity over a 30 year time horizon. And the prevalence rates as well as the transition probabilities were based on our systematic review of the literature um, to identify these, these values and based also on public data sources. So with every cost-effective analysis, there's certain assumptions that need to be made and, and ours, of course, was no different. Um, so we did assume that all individuals were appropriate and healthy enough to undergo colonoscopy for colorectal cancer screening at the age of 50. Um, we that the index um, endoscopy was bundled with colonoscopy um, and therefore uh, would not occur any additional anesthesia costs or facility utilization fees, um, but subsequent endoscopic procedures if they were needed, so for surveillance, would actually be a non-bundled, quote unquote, non-bundled um, exam. We also assume that for early stage and respectable um, non-cardiogastric adenocarcinoma, that 20% of these would be amenable to ESD, endoscopic submucosal dissection, and the remainder would um, be eligible for partial gastrectomy. And that really was to take into account the availability, expertise of ESD in the US, but then also um, not all early gastric cancers are amenable to ESD. Um, so based on surface ulcerations on um, the size, so we um, decided on this, but then also did extensive sensitivity analyses around these percentages since they were based on um, our own opinion. Um, and then we also assume that if the transition probabilities, um, according to race and ethnicity, weren't available, that they were the same. 
And again, since this is an assumption, um, we did several sensitivity analyses around this varying that assumption. And so our outcomes were reported in incremental cost-effective ratios, or ICERs, um, and we set the willingness to pay threshold at $100,000 per quality adjusted life year. And this is pretty standard for um, studies in the United States, and there's no set or predefined um, willingness to pay threshold. Um, but even more recent studies have actually suggest that based on the US GDP, then maybe this threshold should even be higher. Um, but we selected 100,000. And so the, mo the most cost-effective strategy was that with the lowest ICER, um, or the highest net health benefit. And like I mentioned, we did several um, uh, one-way one sensitivity analyses for each of the variables that we entered into the model. And this is um, just a non-exhaustive um, selected list of some of the transition and outcome probabilities just to give, um, and give an idea. And so you can see um, here the transition probability. So the probability of um, transitioning from H. pylori gastritis um, to atrophic gastritis and um, further from that. We did this for each race and ethnicity. And then also certain outcome probabilities. And in our model, we also built in the probability of a missed lesion. Um, and because these lesions can be quite subtle, um, so, so that is a non-zero probability. But then also the, um, we also modeled the probability of a successful resection, so any possibility of uh, recurrence. And so we found that compared to the no screening strategy, that endoscopy at the age of 50 year olds with um, surveillance was in fact cost effective for all groups except for non-Hispanic whites and at our predefined threshold. So you can see that it was most cost effective for the Asian group at 71,451, um, but also for Hispanics and non-Hispanic blacks. And the biennial EGD, um, irrespective pathology, was dominated um, for all races and ethnicities. And basically what this means is that that was a scenario that was less effective, but more, more costly. And so like I mentioned, we did um, extensive sensitivity analyses um, on each of these variables. And so for each, um, we varied these while holding all the other variables stable. And the rationale behind this is to really identify factors with the greatest impact on cost effectiveness and to also determine the influence of various assumptions that we made um, and estimates for all the variables used. And so for um, blacks, non -Hispanic, for blacks, um, Hispanics, and Asians, um, the, the strategy which was cost effective was the endoscopy at the time of colonoscopy. And so those models were all um, sensitive to the baseline probability of intestinal metaplasia, the transition probabilities of intestinal metaplasia to dysplasia, dysplasia to local or early cancer, and then local to regional cancer. And this really emphasizes the fact that that this really does depend on diagnosing these early lesions and, um, and trying to avoid late stage diagnoses. And then the costs were endoscopy, ESD, as well as gastrectomy. And this is again, um, so with these sensitivity analyses, we determined the values um, below um, or above which the screening strategy was no longer cost effective. And this is just to, to illustrate some of those. So for example, if um, among Asians, the probability of transitioning from intestinal metaplasia to dysplasia exceeded 1.8%, then that strategy would be no longer cost effective. And you can see for the prevalence of intestinal metaplasia as well as certain costs. So based on this, we heard how um, that among uh, Asian Americans, there's a lot of, uh, there's differences in terms of the gastric cancer incidence. So we really wanted to extend this to see what the cost effectiveness would be for screening different um, types of Asian Americans. And we know that this is a very diverse group covering over 30 countries of different cultural practices, dietary practices. Um, so we wanted to see what, um, what the effect would be there. And so we, we saw a very nice slide of this, but really just to emphasize that um, Japanese and Korean Americans really have um, a significantly higher rates of cancer um, compared to um, Asian Americans as an aggregate group. And so we pretty much set up the same um, model, um, but our inputs were really focused on um, these disaggregated Asian American um, groups, same exact uh, modalities. And this is what we found that it was cost effective still for all Asian American groups um, by disaggregated, um, based on their disaggregated um, ethnic origin. Um, but you can see that as we would expect, um, it was most cost effective in Japanese Americans, Chinese Americans, Korean Americans, and Vietnamese Americans. And for this one, we did, we did have enough data to separate it by uh, men versus women. And so in both groups, it is cost effective. <laughs> 
And so just a, a summary of that kind of in order of, um, so Chinese, Japanese, and Korean Americans, um, for which this would be most cost effective, but to really emphasize that it's cost effective for all groups, while biennial EGD um, screening in the presence of normal pathology is not effective. And this could also really be extended to any immigrant group who's coming from a high incidence, um, high incidence uh, region for gastric cancer. And we recently did a systematic review and meta-analysis um, looking at immigrant populations to the United States and did find that the, um, the risk of incident gastric cancer is still 1.2 to 5-fold, and there is still a significant in increased risk of mortality. And of course, there's several variables that do go into this, um, but still emphasizing the fact that other immigrant groups do need to also be considered here. So the limitations um, of this really are pretty reflective of limitations of other cost effectiveness analyses, that it does depend on the quality of the data that's being inputted into the model. Um, so there are limited data regarding the progression of gastric perineoplastic lesions and no comparison studies based on race and ethnicity alone. Um, we have lack of precise estimates for additional risk determinants um, that I mentioned, so things like diet, immigration, generation, um, liberal acculturation, smoking, and other factors. Um, same with utility scores, that it was limited in terms of um, stratification by race and ethnicity, so we did assume that these were the same. But again, sensitivity analyses um, didn't, didn't yield too much here. And this model does assume that individuals have elected for colonoscopy um, for colon cancer screening, so that does need to be taken into account. And also that this is applicable only to intestinal type non-cardiogastric um, cancers, which we mentioned does actually have that perineoplastic lesion. But theoretically, um, this could actually benefit then for other upper GI cancers that might be found. So the take home points here, um, as we've seen already, that there are marked racial and ethnic differences in gastric cancer incidence in the US. And the pool of this at-risk population is growing. Um, right now, as of 2018, we're at 30% of the US population are foreign-born immigrants um, or their US-born offspring. And most of these are from regions of high gastric cancer incidence and mortality. And we have demonstrated that they do retain elevated risk. Endoscopy for gastric cancer screening at the time of colonoscopy is potentially cost-effective intervention um, for these groups, and then also immigrant groups from endemic countries. And this does support a model of targeted screening for high-risk populations, which we've seen for other cancers. Um, one of the major knowledge gaps that I, that I do want to highlight is that we do have a lack of robust estimates um, for the risk of gastric perineoplastic progression um, based on individual liver factors. Um, and this can only add to further risk stratification models, um, including validated biomarkers to um, enrich these models and make them more cost effective. And that's it. Thank you.